thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, ISR and Dr. Ranjit sir for inviting me at this pra prestigious platform uh, for a guest lecture. So uh, here is my small contribution. Uh, I will talk about dental jurisprudence in India. Uh, it is a vast topic and uh, I don't think a half an hour or a one hour will be enough to cover every aspect of dental jurisprudence in India, uh, especially because personally I feel that uh, there is a lot of discussion about medical jurisprudence in the forensic medicine community. It has been uh, there has been a lot of research and publications and discussions. Uh, it is officially in the curriculum of uh, uh, medical MBBS students. So uh, I think dental jurisprudence should equally be in the curriculum of our um, students, dental students, because it is a pertinent subject. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, I'll try to brush upon some of the major aspects of dental jurisprudence um, in the next few minutes. So uh, first of all, let us look at jurisprudence. Uh, juris is basically, it means law and prudentia means the knowledge. And so the word jurisprudence is basically knowledge of law. Uh, it is the scientific study or application of the principles of law and justice. Now, what is dental jurisprudence and how does it apply to dentists or dentistry? The application of the principles of law and justice as they relate to the practice of dentistry, obligations of the practitioner to the patient, and the relationship of dentists to each other and to the community or the society in general. Dental jurisprudence has been defined as a set of regulations set forth by each state's legislature describing the legal limitations and regulations related to the practice of dentistry, dental hygiene, and dental assisting. So uh, dental jurisprudence basically deals with a few relationships uh, like the dentist-patient relationship, this dentist relationship, and the dentist and state or government relationship. Uh, now, this relationship has several aspects to it, which one of the most, uh, the major aspect is ethics. Now, there is a slight difference uh, between what is ethical and what is legal. There are some conducts, <coughs> some actions which may be unethical, but uh, could still be legal. Uh, but there are no such conducts which are uh, illegal and uh, ethical. Okay, so there is a very uh, sharp line between what is ethical and what is legal and dentists are guided by the regulations given by Dental Council of India and uh, some acts by the government of India, uh, which guide us to be both ethical as well as legal in our conduct. So there are some relevant acts which dentists should be aware of when they are practicing, uh, have, when they're having a clinical practice, especially. Um, the major one is the Dentist Act of 1948, uh, which gives the uh, statutory uh, regulation of the dental profession. There was a dentist code of uh, ethics regulation, which came into force in 1976. It was revised recently in 2014, um, which I believe every dentist uh, should uh, be aware of it, they should have a copy of it, and um, they should definitely be uh, very familiar with this code of ethics. Then there is the CPA or the Consumer Protection Act, Indian Contracts Act, and the Indian Penal Code. <coughs> I'm so sorry. It will, uh, it is, uh, I mean, uh, not practical to say that the dentist should know the whole Indian Contract Act or all the IPCs but they should know, they should be aware with the familiar uh, or the relevant sections of the IPC or relevant sections of the Indian Contract Act and the CPA. There is a biomedical waste uh, rules, which is again for clinical practitioners, very important. Drug prescription policy and drugs and cosmetic acts. Again, it is very important if you are a clinical practitioner and the clinical establishment act. A dentist should have acquaintance with the main provisions of these acts. He should know the responsibilities and precautions to be taken to avoid any untoward happenings, including legal problems. He should also be familiar with his legal liabilities and the meaning of, this, of some of the terms which are used. So some of the most common terms 
uh, which are used in dental jurisprudence are these. I will not cover everything. It is beyond the scope of this lecture. But the major ones include plaintiff, which is also known as the complainant or the person who is complaining or bringing legal action, uh, which accuses the dentist of doing something wrong or the defendant or the accused, the person who has been accused or who has uh, the person against whom the legal action is being brought. Uh, tort, which is the wrongful act that results in injury to one person by another. Now, there are legal definitions of assault and battery. Uh, assault is uh, even if it's just a gesture without the actual action. So if, if whoever makes any gesture or pre any preparation intending or knowing it to be likely that such gesture or preparation will cause any person present to apprehend that he who makes the gesture or preparation is about to use criminal force to that person is said to commit an assault. So it doesn't have to be an action, but uh, even if there is fear that this person is going to uh, take some action or uh, make some gesture that will be considered assault. Whereas a battery is when there is actual action. So an act that results in harmful bodily injury to the victim without the victim's consent, a battery can be defined as a completed assault. Then there are other uh, uh, terminologies which I feel would be self-explanatory. So I have not uh, put a lot of um, effort in uh, putting the definition over here on the slide. There is deprivation of character, invasion of privacy, fraud. Um, there is something called as admission against interest. So a statement made by an individual which serves to defeat his or her interests uh, is known as admission against interest. Uh, in Latin, there is a term called as res geste which means things done or part of the actions. Statement made spontaneously at the time of alleged negligent act are admissible as evidence. So for example, if the dentist says, oh no, I did, I have done a mistake suddenly, you know, uh, uh, they say something like this in front of a patient and they say, oh no, uh, or, you know, something uh, which says that uh, they have done something wrong or sorry, or, uh, you know, uh, if it's a sudden response to some of their action, it can be used against them as evidence later on in court. A careless word or statement by an auxiliary can be just as damaging. If your assistant or your hygienist says something like this, that can also be considered just as damaging. There is something called as contributory negligence, failure on part of the patient to follow the dentist instructions during and after treatment will be considered as, considered as contributory negligence. And there is malpractice, which is professional negligence, failure to perform one's professional duties completely. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about negligence, failure to do something which a reasonable man would do or doing something which a prudent or reasonable man would not do. So uh, something which you're supposed to do and you're not doing it or something which you're supposed to not do at all, but you are still doing it. So what is a reasonable person? There are certain factors uh, which define a reasonable person. It could be the uh, standards people uphold in, the, in that particular community or society. Then there are professional standards of conduct, which are guidelines laid down by the professional bodies. And there are other environmental or situational factors at that time. So the word negligence is, it means the lack of proper care and attention or culpable carelessness. And it is derived from the uh, Latin word negligio. Neglect has been described as fail to care for or to do, overlook the need to not pay attention to or disregard. Okay, so uh, negligence has um, a, a, a few uh, components in it. Only then if these few components are fulfilled, then then act is called to be a negligence. So it is a breach of duty caused by omission to do something which a reasonable person would do or doing something which a prudent and a reasonable person would not do. The Supreme Court of India believes that the essential component of negligence are three, duty, breach, and <coughs> sorry, resulting damage. So uh, there should be a duty to do a particular act or not do a particular act. There should be a breach of that duty and there should be some damage which has happened because of this action. 
So uh, there is one example of a case from India. The patient complained to the commission that following extraction of the wisdom tooth, that is tooth number 4A, uh, bleeding continued for four days, even after placement of sutures. It was later noticed by another doctor that both the blood pressure and clotting times were high. On prescription of relevant medication, the bleeding subsequently stopped. Following this, however, the complainant situation deter deteriorated and he was admitted to a local hospital where bypass surgery was advised. So the patient uh, then filed a complaint stating that these were the consequence of negligence while extraction, as well as a failure to take note of the blood pressure and his heart condition before extraction. What the complainant, however, held back was that his visit to the local hospital was for recall. He had already, already visited the same hospital earlier and the doctors had suggested a follow-up. Moreover, medical experts testified in the consumer forum that the continuous bleeding could be a result of blood pressure due to various reasons such as stress and not necessarily the direct result of tooth extraction. Hence, the National Commission dismissed the complainant petition and ruled in favor of the dental practitioners. So in this case, there was contributory negligence from the patient because he failed to go for the follow-up um, which he, he was advised. So a simple lack of care, an error of judgment or an accident is not proof of negligence on part of the health professional. Health professionals or uh, you can say for us dentists, they are also human beings. So uh, it is possible that a person may have a lack of judgment or a small ac minor uh, accident. It doesn't mean that he was negligent. So long as the doctor follows a practice acceptable to the profession of that day in that region, he or she cannot be held liable for negligence merely because a better alternative course or method of treatment was also available. For an act to be considered negligent, the following aspects must be present. So duty, the dentist owed a certain standard of care. Breach, dentist did not maintain that standard of care. And causation, there was an injury resulting from the lack of care. There was some damage because of this. There should be a connection or proximity between the negligent act and the resultant injury or damages. So there should be some relationship between the two. Essential components of negligence are duty, breach, and resulting damage. Now, uh, dental records, uh, we as forensic odontologists stress a lot on the importance of dental records and maintaining dental records uh, for successful identification of human remains. So uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, from also from the dental jurisprudence point of view. Now, uh, some people use these two terms synonymously. So they use it interchangeably, sometimes dental jurisprudence and sometimes forensic odontology. But uh, there are some authorities who have said that dental prudence is more uh, towards the branch of law and forensic odontology is more towards the branch of dentistry. So there is a slight difference between these two. And today we look at dental records from the point of dental jurisprudence. So, but this is also important for us as forensic odontologists. Dental records may well be the only permanent evidence if or when questions of litigation arise. So uh, for example, in the previous case, we saw where the first patient made those allegations, whereas he hid the fact that he failed to turn up for the follow-up, which was advised. So uh, in such case, if the dentist or the uh, whoever is the practitioner, he if he has the uh, proof or he has dental records in which it clearly mentions that there was follow-up advised and the patient failed to turn up for the appointment, that is a very strong evidence from his point of view to protect himself or defend himself. So therefore, it must be stressed that one of the most important factors in self-protection is the maintenance of accurate, full, and up-to-date records of all treatments provided. So dental records contain information of the treatment and dental status of a person during his or her life. There are certain difficulties associated with improper dental records. Usually, the content of the dental record, sir, please let me know when I have to stop, OK? Yes, sir. Uh, you can continue. So the content of the dental records would be uh, usually it is clinical in nature because a dentist is uh, working from his point of view and not from the point of view of a forensic odontologist. 
all information in the dental record should be clearly written they should be uh, signed and dated uh, in practices with more than one dental practitioner the identity of the practitioner rendering the treatment should be clearly noted and any copy of the re record should be easy to read handwritten entries should be legible however you know that most of the dentists uh, are now moving towards digital records a single line should be drawn through the incorrect info so we try not to hide or scribble over if, if there is a mis mistake or error or you know we try not to apply white ink but just a single line to show that it has been cancelled the following should be included in the dental record database information such as name birth date address and contact information place of employment and telephone numbers medical and dental histories progress and treatment notes and the patient has a right to request to see their own record so uh, dental records we should also try and include conversation about the nature of any proposed treatment diagnostic records including charts and study models medication prescriptions including types the dose amount or directions for use and the number of refills radiographs patient complaints and resolutions laboratory work order forms refer referral letters and consultations with any other doctors so uh, we have to be careful that uh, all all these additional documents such as prescriptions or uh referral letters etc should have the registration number of the dentist which is given to him him by the state dental council patient non compliance and missed appointment should be noted follow up and periodic visit records should be noted post operative or home instructions should be noted um entry should be objective in nature also if the uh, dentist is making a diagnosis but they are not uh, the diagnosis is not confirmed it should be mentioned that the diagnosis is under review um, this is all defend themselves uh, in case there is a allegation later on consent forms waivers refusals and authorizations should be included a document of patient's refusal to accept the recommended treatment and cancelled appointments so uh, the records can be released provided they present a valid properly served warrant court order subpoena or administrative request in case of administrative request two conditions must be met information sought must be related to a leg legitimate law enforcement inquiry and reasonably limited to the scope of that inquiry so uh, the radiographs should include uh, whether it is right and left or mounted radiographs indicate the date of exposure as well Well, to prevent loss of content seal each envelope containing loose radiographs before releasing them to authorities your name telephone number and address prominently on any radiographic envelopes uh, should be uh, present before you release them do not staple through any radiographs a duplicate set of release documents should be kept with the dentist if requested record is misfiled or lost within your practice and cannot be located the dentist should report the result of a unsuccessful search to requesting authorities as soon as possible appearance or in court is essential to contest disclosure and explain the basis for refusing before any sanctions for failure to comply are imposed whenever possible a dentist should release original records and radiographs in person not by mail it may also be a good idea for the dentist to obtain a receipt so uh, it is always good to hand over the uh, original records to the investigating authorities directly by hand uh, and uh, keep a duplicate copy for your own records in your clinic and uh, to take a receive uh, from the investigating authorities when you are handing your original records over now there is a slight difference in consent taking as well if you are doing it in forensic practice as compared to that in a clinical practice so uh, generally in, in individuals in custody have the same rights to medical care as any other patient it includes privacy and confidentiality it may be a conflict between practitioner's duty to patient and to those who instruct him or her to provide forensic services so the patient must be told if you act for a third party reports must be objective and impartial consent is important disclosure of information usually requires consent practitioners should raise concerns about services which are inadequate and or hazardous so um, 
this is for uh, treatment and if you are collecting evidence such as dental impressions for uh, forensic um, your forensic purpose and for your uh, investigation uh, then uh, it's different you, uh, usually uh, in our practice where i work uh, we always take consent and in 100% of my cases the uh, all the accused have given uh, informed consent before uh, we take the impression but uh, theor theoretically speaking if they don't uh, give uh, they're not willing to give consent mm, obviously i mean uh, we uh, the police say that we are allowed to use force but obviously we cannot uh, i mean at least i cannot use force when i am taking dental impression if the accused is not willing so uh, we usually uh, ask for a court order for taking the dental impression and if the court uh, gives this order that you are supposed to take the impression with or without the consent of the accused then reasonable force from with the help of police can be applied for taking dental impressions. Examination in custody, evidence of involvement in crime, dealing with illness and injury, uh, sometimes uh, assessment of fitness for detention or interview. Individuals have the right to refuse to be examined, treated or provide intimate samples. So they may refuse uh, initially if, uh, if they have the right to refuse if they don't want to uh, give their samples. Can be capacious, informed and voluntary. It can be influenced by illness, distress, alcohol, drugs, being in custody, but most people can make valid decisions even in difficult situations. So it is possible that they are being pressurized uh, by other agencies to give consent for their uh, evidence collection, but they don't want to actually give. So you have to make sure that you are taking informed and voluntary consent. Consent to examination. If this is refused, the fact that fact should be documented and examination should not proceed. When obtaining consent, patient should be advised that information may be sought by police or lawyers. If consent may have not uh, may have not been given for a purpose subsequently proposed, patient should be asked again. Patient's privacy and dignity must be requested, but also balanced against safety of the examining practitioner. Normal practice is examination with a police officer within discrete proximity. So uh, always try that one police officer is present when you are doing any examination or any uh, evidence collection or impression taking. When examiner, when examining a prisoner, victim or police officer of the opposite sex, a chaperone should be present. But a police officer has a duty to report events and pass information to the prosecutor. This includes chaperone. So um, this is like for male dentists, if you're taking impression of a, a female victim or female accused, it is always a good idea to have a female present, uh, a female police constable or a female uh, staff present from your own clinic uh, in the proximity when you're doing it. Confidentiality and evidence. A forensic examination is usually for obtaining uh, evidence. Forensic practitioners should tell people that part of their job is to obtain evidence for the police and no assurance about confidentiality can be given. Also, they are required to disclose information obtained at the consultation, which might influence the outcome of a case. So, <clears throat> If in case while history taking uh, the accused or, or whoever they confess to doing something, you are supposed to mention everything in their own language uh, in, in the history taking section. Information obtained with the necessary consent for forensic purposes may be disclosed. Information obtained for purely therapeutic purpose is subjected to usual rules of confidentiality. So this is a difference between uh, forensic consent and a uh, consent in usual dental practice. So you, the, all the information, personal information, which a patient is giving you in your usual dental clinical practice uh, cannot be disclosed. It, it, it comes under the usual rules of confidentiality. It may be hard to distinguish and consent should reflect this. Only forensic information should be included in the statement for the police. If police request disclosure of therapeutic information, the individual's consent should be provided. If this is not available, a court order is necessary. So if you're going inside the prison to give treatment and not for forensic examination as a dentist to give treatment, then that 
prisoner will be your patient and the rules of confidentiality will apply so if he is giving you a history of some medical problem or some illness that will come under the rule of confidentiality as your regular patient because you have this doctor patient relationship with them and you're not going as a forensic examiner but if you're going for evidence collection as a forensic examiner then different rules apply so uh, forensic practitioners should state why therapeutic information is not disclosed its existence should be stated so the information is with you it's just that you can't disclose it a non uh, as non disclosure of information can lead to miscarriage of justice this is important only the information required by the police to look after an individual including giving medication should be put in the custody record all other information should be recorded in private notes the conclusion is the law on confidentiality is complex and comes from several sources custody and the requirement for criminal evidence complicates matters forensic practitioners remain bound by professional standards consent to examination and disclosure of is important and if you are in doubt or under pressure you should always consult your defense body or you know your particular association or the dci you can refer to those bodies for guidelines uh, or for guiding you if you are under pressure to disclose information now consent in dentistry i will not uh, go a lot into detail because this is more however uh it should be noted that a lot of it is covered under the consumer protection act and all dentists should be um familiar with this consumer protection act uh because i know that earlier was you know when i graduated there were not a lot of cases of dental negligence or even the patient were uh, you know they were they uh, never uh, put in a lot of efforts for research and uh, trying to find out if the dentist has done something wrong but now uh, in this uh, era in india the patient is educated they google everything they read research articles and they are aware of their rights so a dentist should be aware of a patient right as well and they should be aware uh, they should be able to um, defend themselves against any false allegations uh, made by such patients so they should be aware of the consumer protection act uh, i feel they should be familiar with the provisions um i will so there are different types of consent uh, in uh, health profession in india implied consent is one which is not written but legally effective implied consent is presumed when patient comes to a doctor's room for a consultation and they wait for the doctor so if the patient is entering your clinic and they are waiting for you in the waiting room and they are coming and then sitting on the chair so it basically means that it is implied that the patient is giving consent for a primary examination they are willing to uh, tell you their complaint and they are willing to listen to your advice primarily so such implied consent only goes to history taking and ordinary medical or for dentist dental examination such as inspection palpation and auscultation it does not cover the consent for examination of private parts of the patient or matters such as injections or whatever minor surgeries etc so it doesn't mean that the patient has agreed for the treatment it doesn't mean that you uh, start doing a root canal treatment or start extracting the tooth for that you will need a specific consent so that for that you will need a informed consent informed consent is the idea that the patient must be given enough information about the proposed treatment in an understandable language the informed consent is to force the doctor to give patient knowledge that will make him or her on equal bargaining partner so they should be aware of all the options which are available to them and what are the advantages and disadvantages of the different treatment plans so um, informed consent is meant to transform the essence of doctor patient relationship from status to contract so once they know all their op treatment options and what are the advantages disadvantages the maybe whether they are cost effective or not their patient has a right to decide once all the information is with him 
a study of 20 cases uh, concluded the most of the lawsuits in oral surgery practice can be prevented either through preoperative measures or by dealing with the impact of surgical error through good patient rapport and communication. The answer to such issues has come out to be that the surgeon should not deliberately proceed without informed consent. Adhering to the guidelines mentioned in the following and to be aware of certain laws can prevent us from getting caught in such lawsuit. So there are certain guidelines. If the dentist sticks to those guidelines, he can be uh, protect himself from such lawsuits. So uh, records contain a written evidence of the activities of an organization in the form of letters, circular uh, reports, contracts, etc. Medical records are documentary evidence as per law. Medical records are generally summoned to the court of law in various types of cases in our country. As a general rule, access to medical records should be restricted to health professional involved in continuing care of the patient. Medical records may be used for research and statistics without the patient's consent as long as the patient is not identified or his information is all anonymized. Uh, then there is good record documentation. Meticulous record keeping in healthcare practice is essential because it enhances the healthcare practitioner or dentist's ability to access and monitor uh, patient care. Furthermore, if there is a dispute related to care, this information becomes legal evidence for practitioner and patient alike. A new patient's record should begin with the basic data about past medical history, pre-existing medical and dental conditions, and pertinent previous treatments. Make sure that patient reported history is consistent with the objective findings. It is especially important to record any patient's behavior that might interfere with your treatment, including poor communication, instances of non-compliance or self-destructive behavior. Okay, so doing something which the patient is advised not to do. Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, the patient may be advised that uh, don't eat from that side or don't have something hot or something cold or don't use a straw, uh, you know, for uh, having a liquid immediately after extraction. So uh, the patient has to comply with the advice which the dentist is giving. And if the patient's behavior is self-destructive or he's not complying, then all this should be noted in the records, including if he's missing an appointment or missing a follow-up uh, visit. Be sure to record all scheduled and unscheduled appointments with an explanation in real-time writings of all conversations. Make sure to record events contemporaneously and chronologically. So uh, there are certain legal limits for preservation of medical records. Where, where there is a chance of litigation arising for purpose of negligence, records should be preserved for at least 25 years. So these are just uh, guidelines and uh, for dentists, the the uh, legal limit is three years but if you feel that uh, you know something has gone wrong in that case for example um, uh, if it is a failed root canal treatment or if the uh, sinus was perforated while extracting a maxillary tooth uh, in such case when you know there is something which needs to be taken care and follow up properly it is always better if you keep the records for a longer duration of time so routine case records may be preserved up to six years after completion of treatment and up to three years after death of a patient. There are certain records which are of public interest and are transferred to public records library after 50 years for release to public and those involving confidentiality of individuals are released only after 100 years. Uh, there are certain guidelines for emergency special situations, especially uh, related to consent. So if there is an emergency situation, uh, you can skip the consent or if the, there is no close relative present around. Drug reactions are not considered negligent. Any act done in good faith is exempt from clauses of negligence. A patient cannot be refused treatment on the ground that it is a medical legal case and therefore to be seen in a government or approved hospital. The doctor may be guilty of negligent death if he fails to provide emergency. This is for uh, medical practitioners. Now, uh, I'll just uh, end my uh, session with the, uh, some recommendations. So, uh, in India, the dentistry is governed by Dental Council of India. And the Dental Council of India ha has to ensure that high ethical and legal standards are being followed by the dental professionals. However, individual dentists have responsibility to act in the patient's best interest and to provide the highest standards of criminal, uh, sorry, clinical care. 
An important component of clinical care is informed consent, which corresponds to the basic principle of patient autonomy and respect. The process of informed consent is also helpful in improving the dentist patient relationship. There is the need for maintaining records officially and professionally to protect any against any commercial, legal, and medical legal litigation. Aggrieved patients can seek re redressal in the Consumer Protection uh, Act or Consumer Protection Forum when negligence exists on the uh, part of the dentist. This can result in monetary compensation to the patient, the consumer for deficient uh, uh, services on the part of the dentist. Professional indemnity insurance provides insurance cover to professional people. Now, many dentists uh, sadly are not aware of uh, professional indemnity insurance. So, uh, dentists should be aware of this and uh, as this insurance will provide cover against any legal liability to pay damages arising out of negligence in the performance of their professional duties. However, once a negligent lawsuit is filed against a dentist, a complex legal maze is opened. The best defense is to avoid the, the lawsuit in the first place and maintain ethical standards uh, for the uh, successful dental clinical practice. So thank you for your patience. I would just like to say that this is a vast topic and it was very difficult for me to uh, cover you know, as much as possible. I just brushed on the major issues, but uh, I hope maybe in the future we can have more detailed discussions on this issue. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you all the chairperson for uh, listening to me and uh, thank you so much for your attention and thank you Ranjit sir for the opportunity.